just in front of the rapt attention of the world media, two of the world's most unpredictable leaders, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, held their historic summit meeting in Singapore this morning. In fact, they met for over five hours. It began with a one-on-one -on -one meeting where only their translators were the other people present in the room and ended with a working lunch. And then an agreement in which North Korea said it was committed to denuclearization. However, the details of how this will happen have not been spelt out. Around the world, nations watched this surreal meeting unfold. Even Kim said that many people will think this is a scene from a science fiction movie. For now, Donald Trump has announced the suspension of military exercises with South Korea, which critics say shows that Kim actually got the better deal. Well, lots to talk about tonight here on the program with us this evening. Uh, uh, Ambassador Casey Singh, former diplomat and strategic affairs expert. Jyoti Malhotra, the editor of National and Strategic Affairs at The Print. We have Raymond Vickery, who's a senior advisor with the All right, uh, Albright Stone Ridge Group, uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. via Skype, and senior journalist Ravi Shankar uh, joining us from Singapore tonight. Mr. Vickery, to you first. Uh, it's, it's interesting how the U.S. media is looking at the takeaways from the Trim Trump Kim meeting, but there seems to be an overwhelming view, at least from what I've read so far, that they feel Kim won. What do you think? Well, I think this is certainly preferable to people calling each other names, saying my button is bigger than your button and threats to uh, wipe North Korea off the face of the earth. Uh, that having been said, uh, the, the North Koreans could have had a meeting uh, with uh, President Bush, or, or they tried to get meetings with President Bush, President Obama, uh, President Clinton, and those have always been denied to them in the past on the basis that they had not come up with uh, detailed commitments in terms of nuclearization. Uh, I think we have a lot to be thankful for to the South Koreans for initiating a more rational approach to this. Uh, the stoppage of uh, the exercises, the military exercises, so evidently was done very unilaterally. Uh, our information is that the South Koreans didn't even know that that commitment was going to be made. So this is certainly preferable, but uh, as your lead-in said, unpredictability is the adjective which applies uh, to both of these leaders. So we hope for the best, but uh, as Ronald Reagan used to say, trust but verify, and so the verification is going to take a lot of time. Uh, that's my next question, which is the absence of any detailed steps that would be taken as far as verification of this denuclearization process is concerned. Now, is that something you would be concerned about? The fact that the agreement that the two leaders have signed on is actually rather vaguely worded and not very different from what Kim has, uh, has committed to earlier. It doesn't go beyond uh, what, what he has said earlier this year. Well, that's certainly a very much a concern. You have to realize that President Trump comes from a reality TV background. And reality TV is not to fill in any details. It is to uh, make emotions, uh, to draw uh, the viewer in. And that's what he is an expert at. Now, whether that technique is going to be able to lead to something which is strong and verifiable is uh, unknown. But uh, India has a big stake in this. As you know, there have been, uh, there's been information about transfers of technology, both nuclear in terms of missiles, to Pakistan. So verification as to what uh, North Korea will do going forward is extremely important. We have none of that now, but let's say again that this is preferable. As uh, Winston Churchill used to say, jaw, jaw is much better than war, war. All right. <laughs> You, you certainly have some, some fantastic quotes for us to, to, to look, look back and think about. Uh, Ambassador Casey Singh, would you, would you agree with that, that you know, uh, this, may have, this may not be the best outcome, but it's, it's something? Or are, are you more skeptical like much of the U.S. media is today about this outcome? It remains to be seen because normal sequencing is that presidents meet. The big takeaway is that the president will meet you after you have a game plan, after you have a plan for denuclearization. But here, that thing has come up front. But that's the way that President Trump operates. And he was emphasizing in the press conference that I've talked to him. I'm convinced he wants to move forward. He wants to move out into the open world. You see, there are two basic agreements in the past where things weren't followed through. One was done by President Clinton in 1994. And they were following up on that where they did dismantle Yang uh, uh, heavy water reactor. And West was supposed to give them two light water reactors. 
but they never implemented it. So somewhere it just didn't happen. And then came the 2006 agreement, but that was after they tested, uh, because they had in 2003, they left the NPT, yeah. non-proliferation treaty, but also remember that the Americans in 2001 and 2003 had already overthrown the Taliban regime and Saddam Hussein. So therefore, the signal to them was that Americans may tomorrow overthrow you by force. So that is where they walked out of NPT, and in a sense, America pushed them in that direction. So you can't say that they've always been uh, cheating. Uh, so 2006 is the other agreement where they gave the same kind of commitments, but they haven't, uh, didn't abide by them, but their argument will be, but, but then you had Kim's father, and he died in 2011. So it has taken this boy some years to stabilize himself. There have been a lot of purges, a lot of senior generals have been purged. It's possible that he is looking for a new beginning, but we don't know. But there are two interesting takeaways for President Trump. One is he's getting 5,000 remains of uh, U.S. servicemen which have remained Wh in North which Korea. He kept talking about, now yeah. Imagine those remains coming back uh, just before the midterm elections, and uh, President Trump is going to really milk it. Uh, because, you know, this is a very big thing, martyrs coming home, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the second thing, second thing that uh, he's basically got is uh, that uh, they threw in the dismantling of a missile, advanced missile testing center. Uh, although they probably don't need the nuclear testing center. They've tested everything. Their design is stable. Like, we don't need but it But it now. is, you feel, a con an important concession. But it is. So yeah. they have moved one, two steps forward. Now we have to basically, see how, it plays basically out. see how he pushes it. Which is interesting, Jyoti Malhotra, because nobody could have imagined even three or four months ago that you would come to this point where these two men would be in the same room and shake hands and, you know, you know, we, we would even be talking about this. To that extent, you really have to hand it to Donald Trump that he was able to come to this point. Oh, absolutely. And I think your reporter who just said before this that it was only in July last year, so that's less than a year ago, when the North Koreans fired off an ICBM. So I think the fact that America was within range uh, was something that scared all of America. And, and, and I think from there, what Trump has done, and what is really interesting is that when this story started with North Korea, the Chinese actually didn't know what was going on. They were quite surprised that the Americans had actually tried to forge this some sort of understanding. I mean, they, of course, they got very much into the game because you remember these last few weeks, it's been an on, off, and on again summit. So, you know, the Chinese have since returned to the game. But you, I, I would agree with you, Trump, otherwise, who's this completely unpredictable kind of character who's just walked out of a G7 summit of his closest buddies, flown to Singapore to meet, wo meet who? A, a dictator. Well, you know, <laughs> I mean, but as you were saying earlier, the Americans have a lot of experience with dictators, so why shouldn't Trump meet one of deal, them? Yeah, deal with one and, of them. Uh, but I think for Trump, you know, he, he's looking at it very, very, very simply. And, and I would agree with Casey, the fact that this is going to happen before the midterm elections, where and there's been a lot of criticism in, in his <coughs> inside America. So he's looking at his own voter base, and this is really going to give him that upswing. Second of all, he's shown that he that he can make peace, that he can change history. And that's a really big deal. After all, the Koreas are finally seeing a semblance of peace on their peninsula. You know, it's several generations. Which is it's why Kim was probably right that it feels yeah, like 65 that years yeah. since yeah. the war. So, so, so Ravi Shankar, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting also if you yeah. could tell us a bit about the color of how this has played out in Singapore. I believe close to 3,000 journalists have been parked there from all over the world. Uh, and, 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 you know, you had more than five hours of meetings. You had, you know, so much to follow up on. Um, you know, what's the buzz there about how this actually went down? I mean, is it being seen as, as something with cautious optimism, more of a photo op? H how are you seeing it? Well, um, the meeting itself uh, yielded what it yielded. There is not much uh, 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 excitement in Singapore as such. However, I have seen uh, several Korean journalists uh, are extremely excited about the possibility in the end of Korean reunification. But uh, if I could, I would like to you know, offer a slightly different take on what uh, your, your uh, other panel um, uh, members have said. So I come at it from a slightly you know, different angle. Like if you say uh, uh, 
Donald Trump is not just playing politics. He, uh, in fact, in my opinion, has always from the beginning uh, sort of been jingoistic, but that's a negative term. He has uh, always talked about how uh, the US military is important and nationalism is important. And like people say that he's playing to his base. However, this is not a cynical election ploy, in my opinion. This is what he has built his presidency on. If you look at his campaign, the, in the run-up to the election, his entire campaign was how uh, you, the U.S. has had a raw deal from everybody in the world, and that the U.S. is a very, um, uh, you know, is at the center of everything. Like, it's, it's, it's invented the internet, the cell phone, uh, everything that you could possibly think about. That it affects culture, everything uh, across the world. So he, he says, and he, this is what has struck a chord with his base. It is not electoral politics. However, they sense a truth in what he's saying, that the U.S. is much diminished, and that starting with Bill Clinton and continuing well into Obama, the United States has been at the receiving end of a very bad trade deal, starting with NAFTA, and also China.